look around the room and you see some veterans of classes, people that have come to hundreds of classes, the question is, okay, what's this all about? Uh, and I think it's a very legitimate question. Um, so this is going to be broken down into three different uh, kinds of lectures or discussions. Uh, and the goal is not necessarily to teach you things you don't know. Uh, hopefully that will be included as well. But it's also to give advanced students a more coherent, uh, uh, organized, structured, exhaustive picture on these three items. Namely, uh, core beliefs of Judaism. So I'm sure you all have heard discussions and lectures and you read the Parsha and you know a little bit about what we mean when we talk about Torah or God or various elements of Jewish philosophy or questions that are commonly discussed when we talk about these topics. But the goal is to present it in an organized, clear, coherent, cogent fashion where you could actually, you know, take the course, take the lectures and have five, the five core important items that you need to know about X, Y, or Z. Uh, and that's something that you could uh, transport with you. Uh, so that's the idea. And number one is going to be uh, core beliefs of Judaism. So it's going to cover everything from, from uh, theology, which, by the way, I'll mention because we're going to talk about it today. Jews don't actually talk about as much as other religions. We're not obsessed with theology. It was a very important point. Why not? You know, if we start, always start with God. That's the most important entity. That's the most important reality. That's the most important truth of our religion, yet we don't necessarily discuss it so much. We don't have these deep philosophical debates. What exactly is God? That's a Christian. Christians are obsessed with that. We don't do that. Just, you know, uh, so we're going to talk about what we do do and why we don't do what we don't do. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is Jewish history. Uh, and you'll say, hey, Rabbi, uh, Jewish history, who needs Jewish history? It's just stories about ancient past. And you know what? In a certain sense, he may be right, because a lot of the history is maybe boring facts and wars and migrations and social and economical changes and shifts, and that's not, that, that, you know, that's not necessarily important. But in Judaism, we say that our history teaches us a lot about our life today as Jews. The verse tells us in, in, uh, in Deuteronomy that we have to ask our forefathers, what's the history, what's the story? Because that teaches us today how to live lives as, Jew, as Jews. And not only for us personally, but on a communal, national level, we see that this, I know this is cliche a bit, but history really repeats itself. And we can look at patterns of the Jewish people 2,400 years ago, living under Assyrian and Babylonian assault, and we compare that to what happened when they were under Greek and even Persian uh, control, and we see patterns repeat themselves again and again. And we could take those episodes and transplant them to our life today in America or to the Jewish people in Israel today. And we find trends that happen again and again. And unfortunately, if we do not learn the lessons of history, we're destined to repeat the mistakes of history. Uh, so, uh, so the goal is not just, even though I think that's a benefit as well, to know a little bit about the story of the Jewish people. It's very important. It's our story. It's a living history. We are a continuum. We are an uninterrupted nation. Where we, we could trace our history back man to man, woman to woman, family to family, teacher to student, back to Moses. So it's a live and dynamic history. It's not ancient history of an extinct people. So that's number one. But number two, the lessons. And constantly we're going to try to draw out of the episodes that we're going to encounter lessons for us today. And I, dare I say, uh, when we talk about history, we may learn a lot more about, uh, about how to live today as Jews than maybe even the things that you would argue are more instructive. Uh, and lastly is going to be Jewish life or Jewish home, which is going to be, I'd say, probably the most, what we would argue, practical, um, just ideas of Jewish living, Jewish practice, and, 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 uh, and, and uh, you know, way of life, holidays, uh, mitzvahs, etc., etc. So that's the idea. Um, now, I'm not sure how we're going to do it. We're going to do 10 of this, 10 of this, 10 of that, or we'll, do, we'll intersperse it. I think it's probably better to intersperse it, uh, to, you know, to give everyone a flavor. Uh, but we'll see how it goes um, from the get-go. Okay, so, th- so the first thing I want to start with is, is core beliefs. And like I mentioned, the first thing we're going to talk about is God. Why are we talking about the first thing? The first, why, why is that the most important thing? You know, why is that the first thing we talk about? Uh, I think that's probably obvious. You know, if this is the most important idea. Uh, this idea dominates everything. 
this is the beginning of the Torah. Tor- starts about God creating. Uh, you know, the, the, oh, the first, who's the, who's the subject line of the very first verse of the Torah? What God? And then it starts talking about us, the Jewish people, and our role, and our mission, etc. But that's what the starting point of everything. And that is the one, uh, or at least the, the, one, the great insight of Abraham, the forefather of our religion. You know, that's the, you know, that's the innovation that he gave to the world, this whole idea of, of, of what we call the Jewish God. Uh, you look at Maimonides. Maimonides, in his book, several of his books, but in his book where he organizes the, ten, the 613 mitzvahs, everyone always knew that there were 613 mitzvahs. Comes along Maimonides in the 12th century, and he says, I will actually tell you which one is a mitzvah, which one is not a mitzvah. Because if you actually count all the mitzvahs, quote-unquote, in the Torah, you'll come up with thousands. Thousands. You know why? Because some are general categories of mitzvahs, and some are subcategories of other mitzvahs. Comes along Maimonides in the 19th, in, in, sorry, not 19th, in the, uh, in the uh, 12th century of the Common Era, and he says, I will actually organize to you 365 negative mitzvahs, 248 positive mitzvahs. These are the 613. Everything else are subcategories of these. And not only that, he does it in order of importance. Well, we take him as an authority. Uh, that's what he does. So it's not chronological. That's exactly right. So he starts the first mitzvah, the first several mitzvahs are all God related. Belief in God, love of God, fear of God, God is one. Obviously, yeah, he's telling us, and you know what? I'll tell you that, I'll tell you even more. If you look at Maimonides, his magnum opus, the Yad Chazaka, the Mishnah Torah, which, once again, the Maimonides is, <laughs> we could talk about Maimonides for, for actually two classes in it, uh, but he was a great innovator um, in, in, in a great author. And he, for example, wrote the very first commentary in all of Mishnah. Mishnah, 63 books of Mishnah, written almost a thousand years before Maimonides is born. And he's the very first one to write an entire commentary in all of it at the age of 19. Like living in caves, hiding from the Almohad Muslims who had come to kill all the Jews. You know, that's the character we're talking about. Well, he was born in Spain. He was born in Spain. In Spain. Uh, and at the age of 15, in the age, at the age of 15, the Almohads came in the year 1150, and he had to run away. They run away to, to Morocco, first to Fez in Morocco. Uh, but then the Almohads came there, so they actually were hiding for nine years in the Atlas Mountains in northern Morocco. At the age of 24, he moved to, uh, to at the outskirts of Cairo, today's Cairo, and he lived there for the rest of his life. So he died in 1204 at the age of 69. Uh, but either way, like, that's what he did. You know? so, and, and for example, the Mishnah Torah is the very first work that collected all of Talmud, thousands of pages, right? very dense, right? all of Talmud, Talmud Yerushalmi, Jerusalem Talmud, Babylonian Talmud, all the Midrash, all the Sephardim, Sephardim, Michal, the Torah, Torah, everything, and organized it in a way that makes user-friendly because it wasn't written, and deliberately so. And we'll get to that, of course. Why was the Talmud written in such a dis- disorganized, haphazard manner? Uh, but essentially, that Talmud contained all of Jewish knowledge, but it wasn't organized in a way that was user friendly. Unless you were a great scholar, if you got the Talmud, you got delivery of books, the Talmud to your door, you wouldn't know what to do. Why? Because how do I know where, is it, what is it, where are the laws of mezuzah? I don't know. Where, where is it? Which one of the books? 63 books. Go find it. Tiny letters, very dense. Go find them. What are you going to do? Uh, ha- Rabbi, ha- how, do I, uh, how do I erect a mezuzah? Well, it's in the Talmud. It's got everything in it, right? Okay, I have 63 books. Where do I start? <laughs> so it comes along my mind. It says, I will, and not only that, you find something, oh, it says a mezuzah here. And you're like, oh, it says a mezuzah. Let's learn about it. Oh, this has nothing to do with how to affix a mezuzah. Rather, it's how to write a mezuzah. Okay, well, okay. You know. So the Talmud was deliberately written in a way where not only was it not organized, um, and necessarily by topic, or right, even though there is some organism, or there is a system to the madness. Uh, but very often you would have an item like a, a line item, like think Laws which is not, which not only is not in one place that you would find it necessarily intuitively, but they would take the Laws of and divide it into a hundred smaller pieces and put one piece in every corner of the Talmud. Good luck. Comes Lord Mamani says, Laws of Mezuzah. All of it, connected, organized, everything. All you need, right? He's the first one to do that. Unbelievable. 
he starts off his book, right? First four chapters of his book, which is really 14 books, the Yad HaZakra, and it's the laws of Yesodei HaTorah, the foundations of Torah. And he starts off with four chapters of theology. And then he finishes his four chapters and he tells you, by the way, people, you should study everything else in Torah before you actually study this. Why? And this goes back to the point that we're saying. That studying theology intently is a, is a, is, for us is essentially futile. Why? Because by definition, there's going to be a gap between what we can understand and the definitions of God. Right? We are designed to not understand right, the definitions that we give to God. So that problem with Christianity, how did Christianity avoid that problem? Because they changed the idea of God to something which is incarnate. Thus, they can understand. That's how they avoided the problem. Thus, they talked about that all day and all night. But if we're dealing with the Jewish definition of God, which is obviously just those words, like the different definitions of God, Believing in God does not mean... If someone says they believe in God, does that mean they believe in the Jewish God? No. <coughs> However they define as God, that's what they believe in. According to the Jewish definition of God, by definition, we cannot fully understand that. And you know what? Even Moses couldn't fully understand. God, Moses tells the God, I want to see your face. God doesn't have a face, right? We know that. As we'll see, that one of the definitions of God is that he does not have any body or any parts of body. So what it means I want to say is I want to understand you. Like, you, like when you see someone face to face, you understand them. God says, I'll show you my back, but not my face. That is in the book of Exodus. You'll get to in a couple of weeks, or months, or years, whatever. No, it does not have a back or a face. That's an anthropomorphism, <laughs> and that's the, the second page of my mind, not the first page. What does it mean when we find the, the descriptions of God that run in conflict to what we know is true. But either way, Moses says, I want to see, I mean, even Moses was limited in his understanding of God. Now, Moses is a prophet, so his understanding is much more advanced than we, we are. And you know, I'll tell you guys, at Mount Sinai, all the people elevated to prophecy temporarily. So their understanding greatly supersedes our understanding. And the greater someone is, Right? The more exposed their soul is, the greater understanding they can have of God. Because our understanding of God can only be achieved if we expose the antenna to understanding that. Now, what does that mean? I just want to unpack that sentence that I said. I told you guys that as humans, we cannot understand God. Why not? What's wrong? We're, we can be very intelligent. Very, very, very exceedingly intelligent. Why can't we understand God? So it's not about intelligence. It's, a, it's, I mean, it's, it's not just a, a quantitative amount of intelligence. Hey, you know, if I had, uh, you know, double the intelligence or quadruple the intelligence, if I had a, a 1,050 IQ, could I understand? No, you still can understand God because it's not about, it, it's an entirely different realm, right? It's an entire different uh, uh, a paradigm that we are limited, right? We're limited to the rules of physics, for example, we cannot, we cannot imagine things that are not in a certain set of rigid, immutable laws. I, Maimonides himself gives an example in, in a similar but related area. He says, try to explain to a blind man what color is. He's only blind, never saw, never saw him before in the life. Explain to him what green is. Well, green, grass is green. Do you feel grass? It's luscious. D- doesn't help. What if the blind person is really exceedingly bright? Smartest guy in the world. Doesn't matter. There's no overlap of experience that could allow the blind man to understand what a color is. It's not because of lack of intelligence. It's because they are not capable of having that understanding. Now, let's say the guy, let's let's take the example a little bit further. The guy's not blind. They're not blind. But their uh, eyelids, and by the way, I'm not advising someone to do this at home, right? But their eyelids are stitched closed, which is a bad idea. <laughs> I just thought of this right now. Should have got some time to. 
Right? Let's say, let's say, God forbid, from birth someone's like that. Okay, so they, they it's very capable for them to understand God. Right? It's possible. It just need to under, you need to expose the vessel with which they understand God. They they understand, they understand color. Okay, we're like. The blind men, but essentially, we do have the capacity to understand God, but it's in our soul. So it's as if we have the eyeball, but it's sealed shut. It's covered up by our body. You know, I don't think I'm following each of your sayings. Huh? Does that <laughs> make sense? Did, did, did I make sense to anyone in the room yet? No, I don't mean that. I, I got mean, when you say you can't understand God, I, I don't know how you define it. Okay, so I, um, well, how do we define God? I don't know. You, I, I, it sounds like it's a discussion about... Well, I'll, 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 let, 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 let me say one sentence and see if it makes any more sense. Okay. According to the Jewish definition, God is not bound by time and space. Okay. okay. That is something that we cannot understand. Right. Why? Because it doesn't make sense to us, the idea of existing mm-hmm. simultaneously at different times. Could you imagine now existing in the nineteen forties? Does imagining the universe make any sense? Okay. Even like that, there's no end to the universe. I mean, that doesn't make sense either when you believe that it is, it's true. Well, there is. Uh, there's an end to the universe. I'm saying we know that that, that uni- universe is finite. It's very big, but it's still finite. That's not possible because if you ever start, it breaks down. That's a good question. Yeah. Uh, we don't know why because we're not. Uh, our brain is not. Uh, you know, our experiences. I mean, that's a, that's a great example, right? So Could we imagine God? something that's infinite? We can't. Could we imagine God? We can't. But our soul can. Why? Because our soul is likewise infinite to a certain, certain degree. The Talmud compares our soul to God in five different ways in the book of, uh, of Brachos. The Talmud of the Book of Nida tells us that uh, the soul's purity rivals that of God and the angels. What that means is, is that if we are going to connect to God, it's not going to be with our earthly intelligence, so to speak, rather with our uh, soul intelligence. Mm -hmm. problem is that our soul is there, but it's covered up. Thus, Moses was the person who exposed his soul by suppressing their body, minimizing the effect of the body, exposed the soul. Thus, Moses understood God the most. Well, Abraham wasn't as great as Moses. But even Moses couldn't fully understand God. Okay, Does this make any sense? So, so essentially, we're embarking on a journey where, from the get-go, we're being told that that would, that, 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 that we're going to encounter and observe and define and understand is something that we cannot really be at peace with because we're not designed to understand. And this is the reason, says Maimonides, why we do not spend that much time talking about it. And you know what we start? Finish all of Torah and then come back here. Well, which is a little bit paradoxical because he starts off and he gives this as the first of this book and the first of that book. Right? So it's important to, under, to know, to have definitions, to understand what it means when we say God, even though we are understanding intellectually, but we cannot really be at peace with, that, with these ideas. Does this make any sense? Some? Some? Mm-hmm. Steve, am I making sense? Well, it's much more than that. It's it, it's something that we cannot possibly understand. Oh, we, we could define. So, so we, we work with definitions, uh, and uh, and and we, we, you know we we we're broaching the subject. We recognize our limitations. Uh, now, it's I think it's important for us to know about it as well. It's the first, it's mitzvahs. These are mitzvahs that we have to you know we have to have mitzvahs. And you know what? A lot of people feel very comfortable um, saying, "Oh, I have a certain belief." But not being able to defend that belief, or not being able to, to qualify that belief, or not being able to articulate that belief. And uh, while uh, in Judaism we do not um, denigrate that kind of understanding, Maimonides even starts up his book by saying, hey, we have to understand, we have to know, we have to have a certain degree of knowledge. 
you know, uh, for someone to say, oh, I'm, I'm not asking too many questions. Ah, I believe in God and don't, you know, don't, don't try to interfere with my blissful ignorance. That's, that's good, but that's not great. What's really demanded of us, we have a certain degree of knowledge, a certain degree of clarity in this issue. So we're, we're trying to understand as much as we can understand, as much as we're told about it, and we're going uh, on this, uh, we're approaching this with the understanding that we won't fully understand it, and we cannot be fully at peace with it, and, uh, you know, and to the degree with which our soul is exposed, that's the degree that we increase our understanding. Okay? What do you guys say? So let's start off with my pet peeve. I have a pet peeve about this issue. Uh, and the pet peeve is as follows. I would argue that the most important piece of information on planet Earth that we can, or, or in this universe that we have to clarify for ourselves and for our family, for our children, for our community, is does God exist or not? That's the most important thing. And when we say God, I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the God that has the, all the power. Why? We're talking about the Jewish God, of course. From now, henceforth, we're talking about the Jewish God. What item has the most implications? It means, if God exists, that implies a lot of things. There's a lot of things that necessarily result from that first item. Uh, and I think most of them are very positive. Some of them are a little frightening, but most of them are positive. Even the frightening ones are positive. Once we establish, if we are to establish the idea of God, once we do that, a lot of things have to, by necessity, follow. If there's a God, well, then there's intelligence behind creation. If this is great intelligence, then there has to be purpose. Because intelligence doesn't do things without purpose. Thus, our life, is it purposeful, is it meaningful, or not? That is rooted in the question of, does God exist or not? Because if it's random, then there cannot be any purpose. Because something that happens randomly, right? maybe we could find a way to make it purposeful, but there's no essential meaning and purpose. Not only that, we can also... We can also deduce that if God created the world and there's purpose, we have a role to play, us as humans. Additionally, we could deduce that if God exists, there must be an afterlife. Okay, well, I'm, I'm making the argument right now just as, as, as the introduction. Um, if God exists, then we must be looking for some sort of instruction. It means God is going to imply Torah. God is going to imply prophecy. God is going to imply reward and punishment. God is going to apply purpose. It means a lot of things that are so dominant in our lives that once we establish with certainty that there is a grand intelligence behind this whole wonderful universe, that implies a lot of things. And our life and our life decisions, every decision, small or large, is going to be impacted by this reality. It means if, if it's all random... We have to ask a lot of questions, of course. But if, if God is not a, a factor in creation, in Genesis, and in continually in, you know, involved in the world, well, then there's a very good argument to be made that hedonism is the only logical way to live. That's a good argument. Why? Because we can experience pain and pleasure, and therefore, and pain is, pain is bad and pleasure is good, and let's try to accrue the most of it. Yet most people, I would assume most people in the room, but probably most people in the city, most people in America, don't look favorably at that. And the question is why? You know, they're coming at it from the opposite 
perspective. But really, if they if they were to think about this, they would have to deduce that hedonism is really logical. If we if if God is not is not it's not a factor, why? Because we want the, the the betterment of our existence here and 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 focusing on pleasure here, and the hedonistic way that that's the way to do it. So with all of the Darwinian Darwinian the people that believe in selective and evolution, they'd all be hedonists. Well, not necessarily, because um, Darwinism or even punctuated equilibrium, uh, however you want to look at it, so not neo-Darwinian evolution, uh, that doesn't tell us about whether or not there's someone at the switch or not. So evolution is describing a process. Discussion of God is talking about someone, some entity affecting the process. So they're not overlapping, really. You know, this is the fact that uh, that evolution has to conflict with Torah, with God. Uh, nowhere to, no, no uh, you know, that's not necessarily true. It's not? No, of course not. Because you're talking about... The, the I'll give you an example. We just read Genesis two weeks ago, right? Yeah. right? How many verses do we have describing creation? Not too many. 31. Yeah. Do you really think that's an exhausted detailing of everything that happened? No. The, no one would argue that it is. Uh, so what the role of the retelling of it, that's a good question. But clearly it's not an exhaustive telling of creation. It's not. Uh, now why not? Why wouldn't the Torah go on and spend, you know, five books, ten books, whatever is needed to tell us every detail? Because the Torah says it's not important, clearly. For what the role of the book is, it's not important. The Torah will tell you what you need to know and what you don't need to know. It won't tell you. So then the question is, well, why do we need to know that? I mean, this is how we have to engage with Genesis. But either way, the Torah does not tell us what methods God employed to create. And in fact, we look at the Ramban and Rashi and the commentaries, and they say, hey, on day one, God created everything. Do you know why? Because that's implied in the verses. And day two to day six, it wasn't new creation, it was formulation. It was taking something that is extant, and repurposing it in something else. So what does that sound like? I don't know. You tell me. Does that sound like a different, like a process uh, of ex nihilo? No. Like that's something from something. I don't know. So is it is it possible that evolution can be compatible with Genesis? Why not? Well, we start with simple to more complex. Well, that's how Genesis works as well. What's the last thing? The most complex thing is the human. I'm saying... I'm not saying that uh, that evolution is what the Torah is saying. I'm just saying the yeah, and, and they're 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 mutually exclusive. It's the first one I've ever heard. Well, it makes sense, no? No. But can now, you be a rabbi and, and a and a spiritual person and believe in? Evolution? Why not? Believe in what? Then? Evolution. evolution. Why not? Well, define evolution. Though. Are you talking about? Man came from apes, yes. came from ground. I mean, you know, well, uh, that's another story. Then I think what Rabbi is saying. Well, it, is, even if what he, what is even what does evolution even mean? Right? There's a lot of different uh, well, strands of thought. But either way, the idea, attention. the idea of I am okay, one thousand percent okay, and I will sign a document saying this, and I will broadcast this to the world. I am fine if someone says I believe in evolution a thousand percent. Provided that they say that God is controlling it. Mm-hmm. So if God takes a lizard and turns it into a frog, or a mouse and turns it into an elephant, who cares? What's the problem? God could do that. If someone says, oh, randomly over billions of years they evolved, and by the way, there's not enough time. Because the origin of species starts very recently out of this 13.8 billion year universe. And you don't have enough time to produce 8.7 million species that we have today, especially when you account for the fact that 99% of all species that have ever existed are extinct. So we're dealing with about 100 million separate species in not so many years. Right? That's impossible. Right? So it's illogical to say that, uh, that evolution... Uh, happened without God. If evolution happened with God, who knows? Maybe yes, maybe no. The Torah tells us very, very little about it because it's not important to us. 
what, what means we have to start with what we know and then we, we open up the door for what we don't know. What we know for sure is that the Almighty God created heaven and earth, created us, created everything around us. From the trees, to the earth, to the cosmos, to the quadrillion of stars, of stars, to every granule of, of earth, to every bit of matter and energy in this world. That we know for sure. What we don't know is how he did it. We could theorize, right? We, we, you know, we could opine, we could posit, we could argue. We don't know. That's the true answer. We don't know. The Torah doesn't tell us. Nowhere does the Torah tell us. We do find, we do find uh, descriptions of the great sages that would not conflict with evolution. So the idea that evolution is off the bat, no, no, you know, that's against creation, creationism. No, that's simplistic. And that does a greater disservice to Torah to say that the Torah, if it's written by God, is to be read simplistically. That's a much worse encroachment on the purity of Torah. It's much worse for someone to say, oh, the Torah is literal, than for someone to say, I believe in evolution. It's much worse. Because if God wrote the Torah, it's clearly multiple layers of meaning. Right? If this is God's brain, it's got to be infinite like God himself. So to say that there's only a surface understanding of the Torah, and there's nothing deeper, that is the greatest embarrassment that's possible. Now, for someone to say, uh, you know, uh, evolution to start with that as being given, no, we don't know. It's not, it's not a given. You know, you know, it's not a given. We start with what we know. We know that God created. What we don't know is how. We're okay with evolution. We're okay with non-evolution. doesn't matter. So yeah, so to answer your question, Dave, um, I see no reason for us to, off the bat, I mean, the true answer is we don't know, and if evolution, great. If not evolution, also great. doesn't matter, really. Okay. Then where were we? <laughs> oh, I remember where we were. <laughs> so this idea of God, of it, of it being true or not being true, is the most important question that people will have to encounter in their lives. Why? It will affect the way they live their lives. Mm-hmm. It will affect the way they, what they teach their children. It will affect the decisions every day. Every day. Now, there's a common way to avoid the stress of about, uh, of, uh, that, 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 uh, that accompanies what we're about to do. Because to actually think about this in serious terms, in real terms, is unnerving. It's unnerving. It's, we're much happier saying, of course I believe in God. Do I look, do I look like an atheist? It's much easier to say than to really approach the question, the subject and to analyze it and to ask questions and to investigate the sources. That's much harder. And we don't want to do that. We have an aversion to that. Right? Uh, but we are not going to settle this important question or even understanding this important question, understanding this important idea by saying, oh, you know, of course we believe, you know, we believe, and, you know, that is not the approach that we want to take here. We want to understand it. And, I, and my pet peeve, in fact, my pet peeve, is that, unfortunately, I would argue that the vast majority of people in the world never really think about these things. If, you're, if you grew up in a Muslim country, your odds are you're going to be Muslim and not ask too many questions. You know, if you grew up in America, the Bible Belt, probably you'll, you'll be some sort of believer. You know, if you grew up in, I don't know, in more uh, progressive parts of the country, you might be more progressive. And, and most people, if you grew up in Latin America, almost certainly believe in God, in some, some at least some, whatever you would call God. But most people are not going to ask questions in this area. When, ironically, it's the most important area of their lives. Uh, so our goal is to truly understand what does this mean, what does it imply, what's the lessons for us, how does the Torah present these ideas, um, and try to understand it as best we can. What do y'all say? Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Okay, so l- let's start with um, just the mitzvah. You know, you look at the Ten Commandments. The first three of the Ten Commandments deal with faith. The first two of the Ten Commandments we hear from God himself. The next eight are from Moses. Now, why do we hear two from God and eight from Moses? Why not all from God or all from Moses? Or Okay, so if they stopped it, why did they stop it? 
Why this time? Was it too much after one? Or? Mm-hmm. Well, what wouldn't it be too much after one? That's a good question. Yes, they, yeah. Yeah. If they can handle one, yeah. then they can handle ten. If yeah. they can't handle one, yeah. then they can't handle two. Yeah. Then, the same Moses wrote the last eight? No, not wrote. I'm not talking about writing. I'm talking about the Ten Commandments. They experience at Mount Sinai. Jewish people are hearing. They hear God. They freak out. They hear God again. They freak out and say, no, no more. So they just freak out and tell no more. Moses, you speak for us. Why after two? Yeah. So... There is a good question, right? Good question? Okay. Now, we know that the, there's 248 positive mitzvahs in the Torah that correspond to 248 limbs. 365 negative mitzvahs that correspond to 365 days of the year, which, by the way, is, um, in my opinion, I haven't seen the source anywhere. The reason why the maximum amount of time some a Jew could spend in Gehenna is 365 days, perhaps because every day corresponds to one sin. Thus, every day, if someone did all the sins, well, then they have to atone for all the sins. Every day they atone for a different sin. Put the thought aside. What was the 248 good mitzvahs? What was that? Positive mitzvahs. 248 limbs. Yes. And we have a book written in the 16th century that says, I will tell you all 248 limbs and all 248 mitzvahs. And which mitzvahs correspond to which limbs? So that book's out there. <laughs> it's called a Sefer, a sefer ha- Hasidim. Where's the limb? Huh? What's the limb? No, you're not talking about the body. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So we have 248 limbs. That's right. right. Which commandment corresponds to the heart? Hmm. I don't know, right? Tell us, tell us, study, maybe. Random. Random. So the Marsha, the great 16th and 17th century commentator um, on the Talmud, he writes and he proves it from certain verses, that the mitzvah of I am the Lord, your God who took out of Egypt, the first of the Ten Commandments, corresponds to the heart. Why? Just like the heart provides lifeblood for the whole body, so too, this mitzvah is at the core of every mitzvah. Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, the day that gives us the plan and the vision and the vitality for the whole year. That corresponds to the second of the Ten Commandments. Do not have idolatry. Do not go against God. Why? Because every single solitary mitzvah that we do, it's also an act of faith. You eat matzah. So you're eating matzah. Great. You're chewing cracker or eating matzah. But you're eating matzah because the Torah says you eat matzah. You're listening to God. You have mezuzah. It's God. You do a bracha, it's God. Every mitzvah that we do is a mitzvah of faith. It's the heart of all the mitzvahs. Every transgression that we do, we're also saying, God told me to do this, I don't care, I'm doing it anyhow. So essentially, rooted in every single transgression that a Jew does is a certain degree of idolatry. You are rejecting God. You're saying no to God. And essentially, if we were to condense the Torah, all the Torah, all 713 mitzvahs, into two statements, it would be the first and the second of the Ten Commandments. So essentially, God wanted to teach the Jewish people all of Torah. The problem is the Jewish people aren't ready to, they can't, you know, they can't hear it, like he said, they freaked out. But God said, I want at least to teach him the core, a concentrated version of all Torah. In the first two of the Ten Commandments is included everything. Everything's included in the first two of the commandments. God told the Jewish people the whole Torah. Now comes along Moses over the next 40 years and breaks it down for them. Makes it in a uh, 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 consumable, bite-sized pieces for the people. 
he gives it the dimensions of the complexity of, of humanity. If God is one, wait, then there's one mitzvah. We're 248, let's break it down for us. For us in our complex lives, how do we fulfill the faith in God? How do we do it? In 248 plus 365 ways. But essentially, it's, it's, it's faith. So essentially, our discussion of faith, it's not just limited to faith as a mitzvah of 613. It's really everything. It's all of Torah. It's all of Torah. So, I know we don't think about it this way. We don't think of, oh, I'm going to make Kiddush and Shabbos. Faith. No, I think I'm thinking about Shabbos. I'm thinking about the wine. I'm thinking my kids are screaming and right, you know, throwing chicken nuggets at each other. Like, that's what I'm thinking about, right? But essentially, with every mitzvah, there has to be a component of faith as well. And we'll see how the mitzvahs essentially bring us back to faith as well, which is an interesting thing, you know. Because later on, I wonder if we'll get this today, but later on we'll see that. What the mit, the role of a mitzvah? What's the role? Of, why do we have someone? Why, why do we have to eat matzah on Shabbos? Why? Like, why are we lighting candles? Uh, why are we eating all these foods? You know, why are we wearing tefillin? Why are we? Why? Well, you're supposed to be more spiritual. But not only that, it, they're all put bringing us back to faith, back to God, back to God. So not only is this the root of everything, but everything else leads back to this. Either way, I think we have sufficiently proved that this is important. Okay, uh, so let's do, let's try run through a few definitions here before uh, before we uh, conclude core belief number one. Um, so, like we said, when we say we believe in God, we mean the Jewish God. If someone believes in the Christian God in Judaism, they believe in idolatry. Right? In Judaism, we say they believe in idolatry. Right? If someone says, oh, "I believe in God," but it's actually in the corner, a little figurine. Well, that's not what we say. You know, when we say we believe in God, it doesn't mean a little figurine that you could buy in a gift shop. Of course not. <coughs> so what do we say? What do we mean when we say believe in God? Well, what does it mean? So I want to just run through some definitions, and this is from Maimonides. And what's interesting, you'll see that we're getting definitions, but we're not getting descriptions. Because the definitions are there's no descriptions. So that's why it's frustrating. But we have to take the definitions and use that to develop our perspective on theology. So the first thing that Maimonides writes, and this is um, accepted, like this is the, 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 the you know, this, these are the definitions, you know, uh, of, of God, is that God is the cause of everything. Everything depends on God. God does not depend on anything. And what does that mean? It means that God is first cause. So before there was anything that we can see, there was God. And God brought everything into existence. So it wasn't that, oh, you know, there's God and then there's other things that are uh, in any way parallel. Everything is only brought into existence because of God. And thus everything is dependent upon God. So for example, if you were to withdraw God, which is obviously not possible, but theoretically, just for the case, just for, just for the sake of, of, of understanding, if you were to withdraw God, Everything else goes along with it. Everything else disappears. As opposed to if you withdraw anything else from the equation, God is uh, 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 God is not uh, uh, God's status changes nothing. So that's number one. God causes everything else to exist, and not only that, as an addendum to that, God continually nourishes and sustains everything uh, to exist. Okay, so that's a basic definition. I, I would say if you had to. Um, summarize uh, just the Jewish definition of God and you only have one sentence, this is the sentence you would say. God causes everything else to exist. Semicolon. <laughs> everything relies on God. God relies on nothing. Okay? Uh, but we say God has all the power. What does that mean? What about the guy who has a, is a super powerful left-handed hitter, right? Or right-handed. Yes, they have power because God allows them to have power. Everything else is only relative. God is the absolute power. God allows uh, others to have power as well. That's why you see God taking That's absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. We only exist because God wants us to exist. 
I mean, and, and not only that, uh, which is another important point which I, I hinted towards, but I don't know if I, I made it explicit. And that is that there is a definition of God which is antithetical to what we're saying, and that is that God created and then left the scene. That was a, a very common uh, misconception. Uh, well, not in Jewish cir oh, circles, in, in Jewish circles. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they, it was, they were common in, in, the, in the Middle Ages, uh, Dark Ages, and medieval times. People talked about this, the idea of God creating, but not necessarily being involved still now, which is bizarre. Okay. Um, but, Plus, uh, it seemed to justify something they were doing. Right? Yeah, it means that you know, you know, God, you know, God's not in the picture anymore. We say that God is sustaining as well. It means we are just, why are we just now? Why are we alive? We, we think we're alive until we're dead, until we're dead. I mean, until there's something to kill us, we're alive, right? When in reality, God is continually creating us. We'll get to that a little bit later more in, great, in, in detail. But we imagine that we're, we're alive and that we'll continue to live. Yes, we imagine that we're alive and we continue to exist unless something else comes, unless we get, God forbid, hit by a bus, or we get cancer, or we get heart God, disease. You're saying God creates, creates every day, us? Oh, yeah, every second. Okay. We say that as part of our prayer. In God's graciousness, he renews his world every day. I'll tell you something else. If you read, if you guys remember in Genesis, we read about Jacob traveling. Anyone remembers any oddity about Jacob's travels? You don't remember? Jacob travels and he travels at warp speed. Jacob is going to, uh, to Haran to go find a spouse. He goes there. He turns back. Goes back to, to Israel and has the you know, goes to sleep and has the dream with the with the ladder. So we're told is that he got there and he got back as all one day. Which is not possible to do. He was there. It takes, it takes much longer. And he had what's called Kvitsa Saderach, which means as if, what, what the word means is that as if the earth jumped. So what does that mean? So the way this is explained is that we simply believe that I'm here, right? So I'm in the room. So why am I not? Why am I not in the house? Why am I not in my house? Or why am I here? Huh? How long do you Oh, you getting uh, you get romantic now? <sighs> really? With me? No, like oh, my my family's there. My my thoughts are there. My kids, whatever. Okay, but the real reason why I'm here? Why have I not left the room yet? What do you mean that parts of you are everywhere now? Mm -hmm. yeah, your influence. I don't understand what that means. Well, he's talking at a whole different level. Right? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, he's talking like a romantic. That's what he's talking about. <laughs> I'm here. Why That's have I not left the room, there, guys? Right? Why have I not left the room? Why have I not just poof, vanished? Can I tell you why? Because God, in his graciousness, recreated me here. Every second, God recreates me here. Molest me too. <laughs> what do you mean, you, you walked in here. You were here. I understand. And then every second, God's recreating me. Why? Yeah, why is that? Because, because every second we're dependent. We just said this. We're dependent on God. Right? You know, we're, we, we do not have our own independent existence. This is why we have to really work our mind. Oh, yeah, we'll get the free will. We will talk about free will. We will talk about free will in great depth. Okay, let me say this again. I, God created me. God didn't just create Adam. God created me. No, God created me. And then a second later after God created me, God recreated me and renewed me. And thankfully, he renewed me, and he placed me in the same place that I was. Down inside the house now. I'm say this is how part of our this, prayers. How often is this going on? Every, every second. This recreation. Oh, yeah. Every Const second. Every second. Exactly. I've never heard this before. Well, what's the purpose of that? Well, that's not, it's not a purpose. That's the reality because we cannot exist without God. I think, I think I'm going to try this. Huh? Yeah, I think I'm going to try this. 
Okay, go ahead. Whoa, 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 we're, we're, whoa, 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 we're, we're what? We're a particle of him? We gotta be very easy because God has no particles. We'll get to that in the next one. We, we, we have. No, our neshama is pure like God, okay. Not a part of God, but like God. Go ahead. So that's why the extension of life is not the extension, but actually something that is new and exciting. Well, I, 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 think, I think it's more, from, I would like to think of it from the opposite perspective, mm-hmm. opposite vantage point, and that is that we cannot exist on our own. Mm-hmm. We, we imagine that we're on our own, because look at us, I don't see anyone, I don't see any, no, I don't see any puppeteer, I don't see any strings. That's what we imagine. But that's, a, you know, that, that's fallacious, right? <laughs> In truth, it's because God wills us to exist. Mm-hmm. And thus, every second, God wills us to exist. So what happened with Jacob? So Jacob is in the east. God made him jump to the west. The land jumped. What does that mean? It means that God could recreate. The next time he recreated him was he was Amma. He's on Temple Mount. <coughs> so God did a miracle that he recreated him in, the, in a different place than what he was the second earlier. But the idea of God creating and then letting it exist on its own, that's foreign. I know this is this is a dramatic idea, but this is pretty far too. Well, yeah, because we don't imagine so, and this is why this is why we are approaching I mean, it from death. Obviously, you believe it, but I've never heard it before. Okay, well, that well, we and that's why we we have to take means your point is correct, and that is that it's a very bizarre thought because you've never seen it with just poof in the air, right? Well, the fact that God recreates us every second is very far. That's that's well, because we don't imagine that to be so, but. For us to say likewise that we exist on our own, as if we're out of God's grasp, so to speak. That God we, created us to be here. Hmm? God created us to be here and grow old and die and all that. True, 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 true. true. And, and I know you don't want to talk about free will, but you yeah, know, I do want to talk about free will at great length. Yeah, want, He wants us to have that. So how can you have that? Oh, so he's always recreating us there, and, 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 and he also creates our capacity for free will, which in itself is mind-boggling, if you think about that, the fact that can, we have to grapple. Can I just say Go something ahead. about that? Maybe it's like the, con- the concept of how the body is constantly recreating cells. Getting rid of the cells. You know, you know how, I mean, I'm thinking like a doctor might want to think well, about it. it's not really regenerating you because you're dying. From the moment you're born, you're dying. So even but though, but you're even still you're, you're still growing. being recreated. So I'm just thinking maybe that's another. That's way a to nice look way to look at it. How many cells are we losing you know, in a given day? How many billions of cells are we losing? Tons, right? Bajillions. And the only cells, by the way, that uh, we don't lose. Brain, brain cells. That's right. right. Yeah. I mean, what they don't regenerate. Well, that's do they? that's why that's why you can't fix when someone, God forbid, loses their mm-hmm. loses their optic nerve. You can't fix it because that's their brain. And that's why when someone, God forbid, goes blind, they can't fix it. And they will fix it. Uh, well... Whether God will, God will do that. Yeah, yeah. No, so well, discovery. maybe. I'm saying uh, we're talking about trillions of different connections between the eyeball and the brain. Maybe we could do it. I think it would be wonderful. I saw they, they've been able to huh? replace almost every organ, which is incredible. Well, not the optic nerve. How about in the brain surgeon that... Uh, took part of a brain of a child, and the child was able to perform well as the years went by. Well, that means yeah, that's, he got rid of something. That's, that's, that, that's true. But for us to take a, uh, a, a, a cornea and replace it, or, or a, you know, a retina and replace that we can do, to replace the optic nerve, because that's essentially part of the brain that we can't do, because it's, there's too many. Kinds. If you want to replace a, a heart, it's four pipes, whatever, four, eight pipes, whatever it is. You cut the pipes, you put it in. I mean, I'm oversimplifying it. That's yeah. essentially what it is. And hopefully the body won't reject it. If you had to replace something that had 100 billion micro pipes that are so small, like, that would be a little bit harder. That's all I'm saying. Either way, my point, my point is that according to Jewish philosophy, Maimonides writes this, Nachmanides writes and it's a verse. It's a verse in, in Psalms. Right? We, 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 we read it uh, in our prayers every morning that God is renewing us every single second. 
And um, I think the, the way to think about it is, is the opposite. Don't think about, oh, uh, I'm being recreated. Don't think about it that way because we can't feel it that way. There's no way to feel it. Uh, but think about it this way. Like, the perspective is is that we cannot exist. We don't exist on our own. We're not, we're not, fr- we, you know, we're not, uh, we're not, we're not free to uh, to have existence, uh, uh, son for the grace of God, and for the uh, the uh, graciousness of God. Uh, so we got uh, two definitions in. These do, uh, we'll, we means, you know, let's 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 see what else what else we have. This is obviously we know this. God is not a body. Um, thus, like someone mentioned, uh, the fact that. God has, we see God's face and God's back, that's an anthropomorphism. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just a way of saying something in a way that we understand it. Mm-hmm. Right? If we give finite qualities to God, we would only do that if it's going to convey a point. Mm-hmm. So, um, if I say God is kind, well, that's technically not true. Well, the Torah does say it. Mm-hmm. God cannot have emotions. Emotions are a feeling that a body has. God cannot have that feeling. However, God can treat us with kindness. God can behave towards us in a way that we associate with kindness. And why would this is semantics for me? So true, not, true. So it's, you know, but it, 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 what you're is it's important when you read the Torah. And you read that the Almighty takes us out of the line of Egypt with an outstretched arm. You say, wait a minute. The Almighty has an arm? So is the arm composed of parts? Is, it, is there fingers? So it's multiple? No, that, that obviously is not true. What it means is that the Almighty took us out of Egypt in a, such a dramatic way that in our vernacular, in our semantics, in our understanding, that's like a warrior returning from battle with outstretched arms. Dramatic. You know? Uh, and it's important for us to realize that, that when it says the eyes of God are watching over Israel, God has eyes. God needs eyes to see. You know, so how does God know what's happening in China and what's happening in the United States if they're opposite sides of the earth? You use eyes to this? No, of course not. But what it means is, is that just like when you watch your kids, you watch them with hawk eyes, so too the Almighty treats the Jewish people with the same tender and care and concern uh, that can be couched in the same way that God watches over us with his eyes. Does that mean God has eyes? No. And by the way, Maimonides goes through a God, lot of, lots of examples. He establishes the idea God has no body, no parts. And he moves on to say, wait a minute, the Torah says, let me do 10 examples. Isn't that one of the 13 principles of faith? The, it is, isn't these it? Are the and by the way, the, five, no the first five things that we are going to mention are part of Maimonides' 13 principles of faith. And uh, he is an authority on what we say as Jews when we believe, what, what does it mean to believe in God? Um, beyond time, God is not bound or constricted by time. Now, uh, we obviously cannot even imagine that, uh, but we know, you know, that God's existence does not parallel our existence. It's not the same thing. So the fact that we're limited to this experience, there's no way for me to change what happened yesterday. Is it possible for me to not have said what I said a sentence ago? No. Mm-mm. Not anymore. Right? It's too late. We live in a very linear world, so that is that has changed. Well, for God, God's existing in the past, in the present, and in the future simultaneously. How does it work? We have no idea. We understand the definition. And by the way, let me tell you guys a secret. Repentance. How does repentance work? I sinned yesterday. I repent today. What happens? You have to get back to where we were before. We have to think about what we did before in order to. Repent I repented. For today. I repented. I did a full repentance. Right? I mean, I'm not on the right track of what you're saying. I, 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 I sinned yesterday. I repented today. And what's your point? What happened? Where's my sin? I can't change, I change, can't change the past. Right. Mm-hmm. But, I, but, I, but, but I sinned yesterday. This is the miracle of repentance. My mind talks about this. He says, repentance works in a way that we can't imagine. If I throw the baseball through the glass over there, I shatter the glass, is there any way for me to undo that? 
Is any way for me to make, I could buy a new glass, painted glass? I can. But is any way for me to fix that glass? Yeah, maybe I can, but it'll still have, let's say I try to put it together, all the yeah, millions fine. of pieces. I put it together. It'll still, right? I, I can't do it. Right. Comes along repentance. I never threw the ball. Spiritually, I never threw the ball. I, but you sinned, but you didn't. But, but you didn't because you repented. When we repent, we cross over into another reality. Suddenly, we're able to exist in a different realm, with different dimensions, with different rules. That's well, the miracle I am of repentance. You today, and an hour later, I repent. I cannot take those words back. Well, okay. So, so you're so you're saying, what about if someone else. sins against the man, against another person? But, but your question is, if you sin against another person, how does that work? But we're, we're, we're talking about sins against God. I don't want to talk about repentance. Well, I do want to talk about, let's talk about repentance. Sorry. Let's talk about repentance. Okay. So when I sin against God, right, that creates a blemish that is no way less than me smashing a glass. In fact, it's much worse. Yet I repent, and the glass never was broken. Repentance can work the same way with, with another person. However, it's not just, I don't have to deal with God, I have to deal with the other person as well. If I am able to make sure that that person's <coughs> feelings are repaired to their state that they was beforehand, right, God will do the rest. Rabbi, that, does that, that also means that God always accepts your repentance, but somebody, but a person might not accept it. Yes, so then we'll because deal with that. What happens, what happens, what, what happens with that? That's why it's much harder to, yeah. to get, get repentance from, from, some, from, from someone else. Uh, okay, so we're going to stop here. Um, we're going to stop here. I don't want to go over time. It's 9, 9.15. Either way, we, we, we started, you know, and I think it's, uh, it's a noble, yeah, it's a it's noble uh, I think it should be interesting, hopefully, uh, pursuit, and I hope that we can continue on core beliefs part two or history or whatever we do uh, because I find I, the, even though we're talking about God very, very basic themes uh, it's still very important and very impactful uh, if, if you could you could go over there if any questions I don't I, I would take any questions now if anyone has but class is dismissed <laughs> no questions excellent